Thank you for that introduction, and thank you for coming. I'm very honored to be part of this event, which is one of hundreds of events that are going on around the world today, celebrating International Women's Day in 2012. Um, of course, the purpose of International Women's Day is to highlight the achievements of women, both past and present, and to look forward into the future opportunities that await women of the future. I believe that today is the 38th um, official UN International Women's Day, but several countries have been celebrating Women's Days for over 100 years now, so there's a long history to this. Um, my focus today will be on women in the UK, in the domestic context, but I've included this picture of a Yemeni woman here because I realized as I was putting this presentation together that, to my great shame, it's been nearly 20 years since I did anything to officially honor International Women's Day. And that's when I was a Peace Corps volunteer in the Republic of Yemen, and I organized an event highlighting the achievements of Yemeni women. So I've included this picture of this um, woman wearing traditional Sinani Yemeni dress, really just to remind us all of the, the great diversity of circumstances that women find themselves in across the globe as we talk about women and work in the UK today. So this lecture has been framed around me dispelling myths about work and motherhood. And I will be providing some evidence that suggests that some of the myths or ideas that we have about work and motherhood may not be true in the general population. But I just um, wanted to um, note that we are using population level data here. We're talking about population averages. So it's not to say that these myths or ideas aren't sometimes true for individual women. That could very much be the case. But I want to focus on two particular myths, um, if I can call them that. And the first of those is sometimes called the role strain hypothesis, the role conflict hypothesis, sometimes called the role overload hypothesis. Um, but it basically says that combining paid work with motherhood is stressful and will therefore be harmful to women's health. <coughs> And this is a very old idea. It emerged about 40 years ago in the United States initially, uh, mainly in response to women's increased labor market participation at that time, and particularly the increased labor market participation of mothers at that time, which led to concerns about the impact on women's health of combining the responsibilities of paid work with um, family responsibilities. So you might think 40 years is a long time, and we've moved on a lot since then. And yes, of course, we have moved on. But we do still see, um, as these media um, representations show, um, a, a great concern in the media and in public discourse about the potential harmful impact on women of combining work with motherhood. And perhaps that's because, although women's ties to paid work have increased fairly dramatically over the past several decades, their responsibilities in terms of unpaid domestic labor haven't reduced to the same extent. So this is an example of the amount of minutes that women pay, um, spend in unpaid labor over and above the amount of minutes that men spend in unpaid labor. So the female excess in unpaid labor, if you like, in minutes per day in OECD countries. So these are relatively advantaged countries. So you can see that in places like India, women are spending, on average, five hours a day more on unpaid labor than men are. But even in some of the, what do we consider the more gender equal countries of the Nordic countries, women are spending, on average, about an hour a day more in unpaid labor than men. And the UK is about two hours a day more. So this is still an issue for women. So as I mentioned, this is a fairly old idea. It has been studied quite a lot. And what studies have tended to find, find is that women who do combine paid work with family responsibilities tend to actually to be healthier than women who don't. But the vast majority of these studies are what we call cross-sectional studies. So they measure work, family, and health at one single point in time. So they're not able to actually provide evidence as to whether combining paid work with family responsibilities is beneficial for women's health, or whether perhaps women who have better health earlier on in their life courses are those who are more likely to develop careers, form families, and have better health 
later in life. So what we need to really address this question is, is information about work, family, and health across women's life courses. And we're very lucky in the UK because the UK is really a world leader in terms of studies that follow individuals over time, what we call longitudinal studies. And particularly, the UK is a world leader in terms of what we call birth cohort studies. So these are studies that follow people from cradle to grave. And there are four of them currently in the UK with a fifth being planned at the moment. So um, there's a study that's been following people who were born in 1946, 1958, 1970, and the most recent birth cohort study that we have in the UK is the Millennium Cohort Study of Children Born in 2000, 2001. And as I say, there's a, a fifth study currently being planned. So <laughs> we, um, we, I, I would like to give thanks to the UK Research Councils for their foresight in funding these studies, and also to the participants who, who give up their time and information, which is so important. Um, in these studies. So today we're looking at the oldest of these studies, which, which is the MRC National Study of Health and Development, the 1946 birth cohort study. So this was a study that took people who were born during one week in March in 1946 and have followed a random subset of those people, over, over 5,000 of those people ever since. So they're turning 66 this month. And what I've listed here are the ages at which a wide variety of information has been collected on these people in adulthood and a lot of information collected as well in childhood. And I've um, just indicated the years along the bottom to provide you with some historical context of the lives of, of people in this study. So this data set is really the perfect data set for answering these questions that we want to look at, which are, what is the relationship between long-term work and family roles and subsequent health amongst women in midlife? And are relationships between work and family roles and health explained by early life predictors? So health in early life, but also socioeconomic circumstances in early life that um, partly determine people's subsequent careers, family situations, and health. So the health outcomes that we're looking at here in midlife are a measure of self-reported health at age 54. This is just a general question, um, self-reported health, which is used um, quite frequently in epidemiological and social science studies. And here women are simply asked, women are simply asked um, how they would rate their health, excellent, good, fair, or poor. And if they say fair or poor, here we've considered them to have poor self-reported health at age 54. But in addition to that subjective measure of health, we also wanted to look at a more objective measure of health. And um, at age 53, interviewers weighed and measured these people. So we have objectively measured measures of body mass index. So we're also looking at obesity at age 53 at a, as a more um, objective measure of health in midlife. So um, I wanted to start just by showing you the um, marital and parental statuses of the women in this study um, at each age of adult data collection. So this is the proportion of women who are um, married with and without children, never married with and without children, or previously married with and without children within each age. And what I really want you to take from this is how very traditional this particular generation of women were in terms of their family formation. Nearly 85% of the women in the study were married by the age of 26. Two thirds were mothers by the age of 26. And the median age of first birth was 23. So um, half of the women in the study were mothers by the age of 23. Um, work by Kath Kiernan has shown that this particular generation are also the most uniform in terms of their age of marriage of any generation that we know of, either before or since. So a really a very traditional group of um, people in terms of family formation. This is work status at the same ages. So you can see at age 26, about half of women, when they have young, a lot of these women have young children at home, about half of them are full-time homemakers at age 26. By age 36, that um, proportion of full-time homemaking has reduced a little bit, and there's been a big increase in part-time employment. So 
Um, about over a third of women in the study are employed part-time at age 36, and by age 43, most of the women in the study are in paid work. About 85% of the women are in paid work. Um, and there's a fairly even split between full-time and part-time employment. So what we wanted to do was to take that work and family information from across those ages and try to bring it together. So we've used that information to create what we're calling work family histories. So our first group is we've called the multiple roles group. And this was the most common um, pattern amongst the women in this study. So 38% of the women are in the multiple roles group. And these are women who are married to one person throughout the study, they're mothers, and they have relatively strong ties to the labor market. So about half of this, the women in this group were in paid work throughout at, at each of the ages of data collection, and about half were at home full time at age 26 and then entered the labor market subsequently. We have a group of childless women, and about half of the women in this group are married, and they have fairly strong ties to the labor market. A group of homemakers who, like the multiple roles women, are married to one person throughout their mothers, but they have weak ties to the labor market. So they're either not in paid work at any of the ages, or they might be in part-time employment at one age. We have a group of lone mothers, and in this study, the vast majority of lone mothers are lone mothers as the result of a divorce or separation, and a group of remarried mothers, so lone mothers who've remarried by age 53. And then a group, finally, that we've called intermittent employed married mothers. So these women, like the multiple roles women and the homemakers, are married to one person throughout their mothers, but their labor market attachment is between that of the multiple roles group and the homemaker group. So they kind of pop in and out of the labor market. So this is just showing you the proportion of poor health, both poor self-reported health at age 54 and obesity at age 53 by each of these work family history groups that I've just described. So what you can see is women in the multiple roles group here in the, the dark blue um, bar are the least likely to report poor health at age 54. And when we look at obesity, it looks like it's women who have the weakest ties to the labor market who are the most likely to be obese. So homemakers and intermittent employed women. Now, this is a similar idea, but here we're looking at odds ratios. So for those of you who aren't familiar with odds ratios, they show us the likelihood of, in this case, reporting poor health at age 54 for women in each of the categories compared with women in the multiple roles group. So women in the multiple roles group are set to one. They're the reference. And the black circles represent the odds ratios or the likelihood of reporting poor health for women in each of the other groups compared to those women in the multiple roles group. So for example, the odds ratio for the homemaker group is two, so they're twice as likely to report poor health at age 54 as women in the multiple roles group. And the, the black lines around those odds ratios are what we call 95% confidence intervals. So they mean that we're 95% sure that the true odds ratio lies somewhere on that black line. So if the black line isn't crossing one, then we consider the odds ratio for that group to be significantly different. We're 95% sure that it's different from women in the reference group, women in the multiple roles group. So what we can see here is that um, childless women, homemakers, and lone mothers are all significantly more likely to report poor health at age 54 compared with women in the multiple roles group. But the reason we use these odds ratios and we use regression models to derive them is that we can then take account of other factors that we think might be important in explaining the relationships that we're looking at here. And here we're particularly interested in those early life predictors. So is early health, early socioeconomic circumstances explaining these relationships? So we put those into the regression models. So here we're adjusting for self-reported health at age 26 whether or not women have had some kind of mental health um, episode between ages 15 and 32, and father's social class at age 11. So what we're looking at now is the relationship between health and these work family histories independent of these early life factors that we've included in the model. So if they explain our relationship, we'd expect to see no relationship here. 
Um, but what we actually see is that the relationships change very little when we include those early life markers into the models. The odds ratios and confidence intervals for lone mothers decrease a little bit because they come from more disadvantaged childhood circumstances. So a little bit of that relationship is explained by childhood social class. But really, the relationships remain um, very much as they were prior to adjusting for early life factors. We're now looking at the same thing for obesity. So you can see that women in the homemaker group are more than twice as likely to be obese at age 53 compared with women in the multiple roles group. And again, when we adjust for BMI at age 26 and father's social class at age 11, and we also ran these models adjusting for BMI at age 15 and women's educational attainment, we see very much the same thing, that these aren't explaining um, our relationships. So homemakers remain twice as likely to be obese at age 53 compared to women in the multiple roles group. And once we account for these early life factors, we actually start to see a significant relationship for women in the intermittent employed group as well. So those women tended to come from more advantaged um, childhood circumstances. Um, so once we adjust for father's social class at age 11, um, a relationship emerges for that group. So one of the things that we need to think about when we're studying the same people over time is the fact that measures on the same person over time are correlated with one another. So your BMI early in your life is likely to be correlated with your BMI later in your life. And to do this properly, we need to use techniques which account for that correlation within individuals. So we use something called generalized estimating equations, which account for that within individual correlation. So here I'm um, showing you mean BMI, so this is average BMI um, by age for the two most extreme groups, so the multiple roles group and the homemaker group, using these generalized estimating equations to account for that within person correlation. And on the y-axis, I've shown you the WHO guidelines in terms of what's considered to be a healthy BMI, overweight, obese. So what you can see is that the women in the two groups start off in the same place, and unfortunately, BMI increases for everyone with age, but um, it's increasing at a greater rate, more quickly for women in the homemaker group. So by age 36, on average, women in the homemaker group are starting to enter into that overweight category. Whereas for women in the multiple roles group, it's happening a little bit later at age 43. So our conclusions from this were that women who combined paid work and stable family relationships over the long term ended up healthier in midlife than full-time homemakers, and also um, healthier than lone mothers and childless women, and they were less likely to be obese than women who had relatively weak ties to the labor market, and this doesn't seem to be explained by health or socioeconomic circumstances earlier on in the life course. So i now like to turn to myth number two. Um, when we published the results from the study I've just shown you, one of the reactions in the media was, well, that's great for the women, but what about their poor children? What, what kind of detrimental impact is this maternal employment having on the children? So we wanted to start to look at this. And um, as you can see from these um, media cutouts here, this is something we hear a lot about as well in the media and um, just in popular conversation, the impact of maternal employment on children. But what does the evidence say? <coughs> And this has been studied quite a lot. A lot of the work in this area has focused on educational and cognitive outcomes for children. So reading scores, math scores, that kind of thing. And the results of those studies have really been quite mixed. Um, some of them suggest that it depends on the socioeconomic circumstances of the household, um, the age of the child when the mother goes to work, the number of hours that the mother does. But it's a real mixed bag of results, nothing um, terribly conclusive there. There have been a few studies now linking maternal employment with child overweight and obesity. We've seen that in several studies now. We wanted to look at the relationship between maternal employment and child psychological well-being, what we call socio-emotional well-being. Um, so our research questions were, are children whose mothers are in paid work in the early years, over those first five years of life, more likely than children whose mothers are at home full-time 
to show emotional or behavioral symptoms at age five? And are children more sensitive to the effects of maternal employment in that first year of life? Because that's been suggested by some of the studies that have been done. So here we're using the most recent British birth cohort study, the Millennium Cohort Study. And this is um, a national study of nearly 19,000 children who were born in the UK between 2000 and 2001. And so far, information has been collected at nine months, three years, five years, and seven years. Today, I'm just going to show you information up to age five. So first, this is just the prevalence of maternal employment at those first three ages of data collection, so nine months, three years, and five years. Whether or not mothers are at home full-time, working part-time in paid work, or full-time in paid work. So at nine months, you can see that a little over half of the mothers are in paid work. Most of the paid work is part-time employment. Um, and with each subsequent age, as children are growing a little bit older, there's a little bit of an increase in maternal um, employment, but not big increases, about three percentage points between each sweep. And most of that increase is in part-time employment. Um, and I wanted to show you the prevalence of maternal employment by some of these other key factors that are um, likely to be an important part of this story. So maternal educational qualifications, household income, maternal depressive symptoms, and partner's work status. So as you might expect, the prevalence of maternal employment increases with maternal educational qualifications. So NVQ5 is equivalent to at least some higher education. Um, maternal employment increases with increasing household income until we get to the highest quintile of income when it drops off a little bit. And mothers who are in paid work are less likely to have depressive symptoms than mothers who aren't in paid work. And mothers who are living with a partner who's in paid work are most likely themselves to also be in paid work. Mothers who are living with a partner who isn't in paid work are actually the least likely to be in paid work themselves. Okay, to measure a child's um, socio-emotional behavior, we're using the Strengths and Difficulties Questionnaire, the SDQ. This is um, a standard um, questionnaire that's used in a lot of the big surveys to measure child socio-emotional well-being. It has 20 items, which I've briefly listed here, and covers these four domains. So emotional symptoms, conduct problems, hyperactivity, and peer relationships. So here we're using the top decile, the top 10th percentile of um, scores on the STQ as our definition of um, behavior, behavioral difficulties. So here, um, I'm, first, I'm showing you the, the prevalence of behavioral difficulties at age five. First, in the MOVE bars, without looking at maternal employment, just looking at gender differences, you can see that boys are more likely to have reported behavioral difficulties at age five than girls, and this is a well-known um, finding in the literature. And then looking at behavioral difficulties by maternal employment at nine months, so trying to look at the importance of that first year of life in terms of maternal employment. And what you can see is that the prevalence of behavioral difficulties increases with mothers decreasing attachment to the labor market. So boys and girls whose mothers are at home full time are more likely to have behavioral difficulties reported than children whose mothers are in paid work. So this is, these are unadjusted relationships, it's important to remember, so they don't take account of the things that we've seen are linked with maternal employment, like maternal education, household income, but, but they certainly suggest that there isn't a detrimental effect of maternal employment anyway. We then wanted to go on and look at um, cumulative maternal employment across those first five years. And we've done that with this really rather crude measure, I have to say, of cumulative maternal employment over the three ages. So simply whether or not mother is in paid work at all three ages, two of the three, one of the three, or none of the ages of data collection. So this includes both full and part-time employment. So a little over 40% of the mothers have been in paid work at all three ages. About a quarter have not been in paid work at any of the three ages. And 16 to 17% have been in paid work at one or two of the ages of um, data collection. 
So here again are our odds ratios. And these are the likelihood of behavioral difficulties at age five by that cumulative measure of maternal employment. So what you can see is the um, likelihood of reporting behavioral difficulties at age five is increasing with mothers decreasing attachment to the labor market. So for example, boys whose mothers haven't been in paid work at any of the ages are twice as likely to have reported behavioral difficulties compared with boys whose mothers have been in paid work at all three ages. And the relationship is much stronger for girls than for boys, and this is a significant gender difference. So for girls whose mothers haven't been in paid work for any of the ages, they're six times more likely to have reported behavioral difficulties compared with girls whose mothers have been in paid work at all three sweeps. But again, these are unadjusted models. So when we include those factors that I showed you are important and linked with maternal employment, you can see that they do explain the relationship, at least for boys. So once we include things like maternal education, household income, maternal depressive symptoms, what we see is that potential beneficial effect of maternal employment for boys is actually explained by the fact that those are the mothers who have higher educational qualifications and live in higher income households. But for girls, even once we take those factors into account, girls whose mothers haven't been in paid work at any of the ages remain twice as likely to report behavioral difficulties. Um, they're not reporting them, I should say, um, compared with the girls whose mothers have been in paid work at all three sweeps. So um, despite the fact of accounting for maternal education, household income, to maternal depressive symptoms, there's still this residual beneficial effect um, of maternal employment for girls, it seems. So our conclusions um, are that we don't see any evidence of a detrimental um, effect of maternal employment in the early years. If anything, there's some suggestion of a beneficial effect, but that effect is um, explained for boys by the fact that those mothers are those that have higher educational qualifications, live in higher income households. But for girls, it's not entirely explained, and, and we don't yet know why this is. So I just want to finish by revisiting the first study I showed you very briefly and talking a little bit about the work that we're doing now, moving on from that. So I showed you for those women who were born in 1946, um, the, the women who had stronger ties to the labor market, who had stable family relationships, um, were those who had better health in midlife. But we need to remember that those women were prior to a lot of the big social changes that we've seen in relation to work and family and gender over the past few decades. So they started their careers and began to form their families before we had gender equality in education, as we do now, before the continued strengthening of women's ties to the labor market, particularly for those women who have those higher educational qualifications. Also before the increases that we've seen in household inequality. And we've also seen increases um, in inequality amongst women, between those women who are getting those higher educational qualifications and those women who aren't, and they're really um, facing very different um, circumstances. Also prior to the, the big um, diversification we've seen in family forms. Um, so you saw how traditional um, this generation were in terms of their family formation, and they were prior to the big increases that we've seen in cohabitation, for example, births outside marriage, um, et cetera. And also potentially prior to um, some increases um, that we've seen in paternal participation in family life. So what we want to know now is, are those relationships that we've seen in that particularly traditional generation of women, do they hold true for more recent generations of women? And also, how are these social changes impacting on the health of men and children? Because this area has tended to focus um, on the health of women. And as um, gender roles are changing, it'll be interesting to see um, the impact of that on men's health as well. So we're starting to look at these relationships now in those more recent British birth cohorts to look at whether there are generational differences in the um, relationships that we've seen. And just a quick plug, I'll be advertising a PhD studentship any day now to work on some of this stuff. So if anyone thinks they're interested in working on it, um, please come and speak with me. So it just leaves me to thank um, colleagues who've worked with me on this work, Professor Yvonne Kelly, 
Professor Mel Bartley, who's director of the International Center for Life Course Studies in Society and Health, where I work. Um, Professor Diana Ku, who's director of the 1946 birth cohort, and Tricia Crowley, who was instrumental in today, and um, particularly the Economic and Social Research Council, who fund the ICLS Research Center. So thank you. Thank you very much, Anne, for sharing these exciting analyses. We have time for a few questions, if there are any, in the audience. There's a mic coming your way. Thank you for this presentation. I am wondering about, uh, in the second analysis, about uh, shy, um, uh, the health of child, you take into account the, the income, but you don't take it into account in the first analysis, and I was wondering whether income could have sorry, an impact. Sorry, account for, sorry? Income, the income you, uh, in of the, the household, for the children. No, you take it into account for the children's health, but not yes. for the not mother. for the mothers. Yes, that's a good point. Um, the measure of income in that particular study isn't um, brilliant, and we did look at it, um, but it, it, it had even weaker effects than um, occupational class even, so I haven't shown those results. Um, but yeah, no, it's, we, we did include it at one stage. Um. Why was, obese, why was BMI used as a measure of women's health? That seems quite limited. It is limited. We could have, there were only two objective measures of health that we could have um, included over the life course because not all the measures have been um, collected at every age. So it was either BMI or blood pressure. We could have looked at blood pressure. Um, I chose BMI because I could imagine, um, hypothesize kind of, psychosocial, psychological pathways through which perhaps if women were unhappy with their family or work circumstances, that might lead to um, greater BMI. But certainly we, it is limited and we could look at blood pressure. We should do that probably. Um, yeah, wouldn't um, homemakers um, have more time to report ill health than people who are at work, you know, because... You know, if you had like the flu or something and you're in work, maybe you wouldn't report it as much as someone who's at home all the time and had the time to go. Um, yeah. Do you mean in terms of like going to the doctor and having time to... In the reporting? Um, we can't really look at whether there's a reporting bias, but these are all collected in the same way. So they're all collected by an interview and go going to people's houses. Um, so it's not that it's come from health service use or anything like that. Oh, thank you. Those prevalence charts of um, women who uh, maternal employment, do they take into account um, maternity leave? In the sense that if they, you know, if they were in yeah. paid work, does that also mean they could have taken a year off for maternity leave? So um, they're taken at nine months. And women who are on maternity leave ha are included in the statistics, so they would be considered to be in paid work. Yeah. Have you taken into account the number of children that the women have? We did for the obesity um, finding because um, someone suggested to us that this homemaker effect could be because they have more children. Um, so we did look at that, and it did attenuate a little bit, but certainly not enough to, yeah, it didn't explain the relationship. So the homemakers did have more children than women in the multiple roles group. But when we adjust for that, it doesn't explain the relationship. I'm intrigued by the differences between boys and girls. D do you think there's anything to do with the role models. So when the women are in employment, that it has a positive effect on the girls? It could be. We can't look at that, I don't think, in this study. We did speculate that in the paper. Um, and we also, what I haven't shown is we looked at um, the, uh, the employment situation of both parents, where there were two parents in the household. And we saw that 
for the female-headed households, the boys were doing worse. But in the traditional male breadwinner households, the girls were doing worse. So there were other suggestions of gender differences there for the children as well. So it'll be really interesting to try to figure that out. Thank you for the talk. Um, I was just wondering if you thought about the policy implications of your work. Huh. <laughs> well, that's an easy one. Um, I would say that the results here suggest that it's um, certainly not detrimental and probably quite beneficial to support women to be able to combine paid work with a motherhood um, and finding better ways of doing that. Um, in terms of childcare provision um, and um, yeah, d domestic labor, all kinds of things that hold women back from paid work, um, absolutely. But I haven't worked out specific policies yet. <laughs> I think this is probably a good time to, to end this talk. So please join me in thanking Anne again for sharing these analyses. We look forward to your next.